Elections are not just about political candidates. Elections should focus on the people, their level of satisfaction with the performance of elected officials, and the role government plays in their lives. Insights on PBS Hawaii brings you an important series focused each week on a conversation led by residents from one of the island communities in our state. What quality of life issues matter the most to them in this upcoming election? Join residents from Kauai for the first show in this series. Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of Insights on PBS of East start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Laura Yamada. Well, each one of us who lives in Hawaii has a unique reason for what makes this place so special to us. Depending on which island you live, your lifestyle, your daily challenges and your goals in life may differ from someone living on another island. So tonight we begin a series of six shows going island by island to examine quality of life. Residents from each island will talk about what gives them the most satisfaction about their lives as well as the hardships they endure living on that island. We begin at the top of the chain with Kauai. Our guests tonight include a freelance reporter from the North Shore, a Hawaiian language instructor, a young business owner, and a community activist and cultural practitioner. So we look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and on the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. All right, now to our guests, Alan Parakini is a freelance journalist from the North Shore of Kauai. He moved to Kauai in 2012. Kaimi Summers is a Hawaiian language instructor. She was born on Oahu and has lived on Kauai since 1981. And Kobe Ayanon owns Kauai Air Conditioner and Refrigeration in Kapa'a, a business his father started. And Melia Nobriga Oliveira is from Hanapepe Valley, Kauai. And she commutes to her job on Oahu at the Hawaii Nui Akea School of Hawaiian Knowledge. So thank you so much, all of you, for joining us. It's so fun for me personally to have a bunch of Kauai people around me. Uh, so let's just let's just kind of um, throw something a little bit general out there and just talk about uh, the island of Kauai and of the places that you could have lived, why you chose to live on Kauai. And anybody who wants to jump in? Uh, I'll start. Um, for me, I mean, being born and raised <laughs> on the island, um, it's amazing to be able to come back. You know, I mean, I born and raised in Hanapepe Valley, went to high school at Waimea High School. Uh, my mom is from Kauai. My grandfather is from Kauai. I mean, generations of us are on Kauai, my cousins. So to, um, after I graduated, I moved to Oahu and to go to- so many do. Yeah, to go to the University of Hawaii at Manoa. It was an exciting time. Um, I always said from that time that I would come back to Kauai and 25 years later I'm so excited that I'm now living back home in my Onehanao um, with my mom, with my husband, surrounded with you know my, my brother, my cousins all nearby and just being able to live on our Aina Kupuna, the, the land of our elders is just amazing for me. So family of course but why else is it for you? What is it about Kauai that you want to share with people that you feel is special? Um, it's the community. Um, it's the, the energy we get from our, our land to know that our elders have built this foundation for us um, as salt makers from Hanapepe Kauai, a tradition, a cultural practice that you don't find anywhere else in all of Hawaii that continues it till today. Even though we have the struggles of dealing with climate change and the struggles of flooding and all of that, we are still energized and still excited and finding ways to adapt to it And because it's so important to not just the cultural practice of making salt or pa'akai, but being able to continue to share it and to, to share that ike, that, kupu, that knowledge from our kupuna to the next generation and all the many generations to come, I think is is what we live for. Like, how do we continue this ike kupuna? Yeah. Nice. Anybody else want to jump in? Well, I'm been there for I a guess handful of years the, now. The uh, opposite side of the coin, because I'm uh, a latecomer, so 
only lived on island for six years. Although the first time I set foot on Kauai about 20 years ago, uh, I knew it was where I wanted to end up. I think many people have had that experience. Uh, and it was finally possible for it to happen. Uh, so uh, making the move late in life, uh, being over 70 at this point, uh, I brought, I had started a business in uh, Los Angeles after I left the news and PR businesses. I'm a furniture maker. So I brought that to Kauai with me and uh, have backslid back into the news business uh, the last Not two or to three talk years. About. <laughs> Lots to talk about these yeah. days, whether on a local uh, platform or on a national platform. How many generations has your family been there? Long time. Yeah, a few generations already. Yeah, yeah. and like you know, for me, you know, I, I grown up uh, in Hawaii. You know, live live on Kauai um, almost my whole life. Uh, went to school in um, in Oregon for you know four years, and you know it. It. I remember my senior year. You know, walking in the supermarket. And walking around, and you don't see anybody. You know, you don't see anybody you know. And versus Kauai, you know, you, you go to the market or shopping center, you'll talk story, you'll you'll catch up with people you didn't see for a couple weeks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, instead of a couple years. So that really um, made me realize like how strong our community is back home, yeah. and wanted me to get back because you know it's, it's a big world out there. And I really enjoy like giving back and, and really interacting a lot with, with our community, our peers and, and friends. It's pretty fun when I go back home and Mrs. Nakatsushima, my fourth grade teacher. Uh, <laughs> like, hey! Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's pretty neat. Yeah. Now, Kaimi, pretty... you've been there for quite a while now in Kauai. Yeah, when Hi. I got my master's, originally I wanted to move to Molokai mm -hmm. and figured that Kauai, the opportunity came up and I figured Kauai's halfway between Oahu lifestyle and Molokai lifestyle. <laughs> so I thought I'd try it out for a year. And that was 31 years ago. So obviously it was my speed. So after living there for, for some time now, uh, what, are your, what are your reflections after having been there for a while and you think about um, you know, Kaimi who moved, moved there way back when and had an idea and you know, Kaimi now and what you know now. What are your, what are your thoughts about Kauai and the island, what makes it special? What made it special for me all the way through is the land. Mm. I've always been a um, Malka girl. <laughs> I love the mountains. <laughs> and you've got a good mountain up on, Mo on Kauai that you can get to. So between being able to be outdoors and now being able to teach about outdoors, it's incredible to me that some of our students, I had one student from Waimea mm. who had never been up to Kokei. Mm which is right in their backyard. <laughs> so it was really neat to be able to expose them to that. So let's talk about, uh, there's so many wonderful things about, about the island, but of course there are so many challenges. Um, and uh, some would say more so today than, than ever before maybe. Uh, so let's, let's talk about some of that. We're gonna break down <clears throat> some specifics um, as we get through the show, but just off the top of your head, what do you feel like personally are some of the challenges that, that you see for the island? Well, so my own personal mo'olelo or story, again, goes back to making pa'akai or Hawaiian salt. Um, we're one of 22 families that continues this tradition. Um, but like I shared a little while ago about the impacts of climate change on our cultural practices. So for five years now in my lifetime, we haven't been able to produce any salt at all. Oh, really? So we would go from a year, uh, like in the mid 2000s, where in one harvest, I could, our family could produce maybe about 55 gallon buckets of pa'akai or salt. Today, or you asked me about last year, we were at zero really? for five years in a row. <laughs> we don't know if 2018 will be a produ producing year for us. So explain a little bit more to uh, people, myself included. So what exactly has happened for, for that to... So we see a number of different impacts. I mean, you know, with climate change, we hear about sea level rise. Um, so the source of our water for the production of salt comes from the ocean, penetrates through the land and into our puna or our main source, our well. Um, from there, we're able to transfer the water into the Waiku, the secondary wells, and then to the Lo'i, or the, um, the salt beds, 
where actual salt um, evaporates and is produced. Um, but our wells today are um, overflowing more than we've ever experienced before. I mean, we've talked to our kupuna. They don't remember seeing this kind of continuous overflow. Um, we also see a lot of uh, people that are driving onto the sand dunes by the beach. Uh, and we know, I think many of us know that, you know, driving on the sand is actually illegal um, throughout Hawaii. But we continue to see this. And in, when I was young, the sand dunes are really high. If you're standing in the salt beds area at Pu'olo Point, looking out to the ocean, you couldn't see the waters crashing. Today, I stand there, I can see all ocean activity. And in those times when the sea is rising, high tides on the full moons, um, you see the, the waves crashing, it's overwashing on the sand, flowing directly into the salt making area. It adds to the flooding. So we're working with the county of Kauai and trying to um, provide some protection there where we need to close off a part of that beach so that the trucks and the, the cars can't drive onto the beach. I mean, they'll still be able to access that part of Salt Pond, but, you know, trying to mitigate some of that will have to be like, don't drive there anymore, and we want to try to restore some of the sand dunes. And so we're hoping through education and working with the community that this can be possible. Yeah. It's tough when the enforcement is low, and then other you see other people doing it. It's the mm -hmm. uh, same same when you see people out on the beaches and the rough waters, and you, they say, "Oh, somebody else is in there," and mm -hmm. and then we have drownings go up. And ah, uh, what else for the rest of you? Um, so personally, you you feel some of the challenges on, in particular, on Kauai Island that stick out to you. I think we have to struggle with a few things these days. One of which is the conflict between the island lifestyle and what island people need to to make a living. Yeah and the tourism industry. We are heavily dependent on it. We are probably at a point where we've, we're over uh, committed in terms of our capacity. Airlines keep adding flights. People complain about congestion, which is the traffic congestion is severe, largely homegrown. It's not, not all the tourists' fault, but uh, there's, a, there's a conflict between People who who feel that the that we're getting overcrowded enough that we're that people are not they're coming to Kauai for a Kauai experience that they can no longer have because Kauai has changed. And people talk about the Mauification Mauification mm -hmm. of Kauai, uh, and I think that's a real concern. We are we remain a rural isolated place. We're going to quick throw up a graphic here just to kind of. Back up, what you were saying, this is some of the tourism numbers that we have. Um, and numbers uh, going up on Kauai, more yep. so than elsewhere. But, but again, I mean, it's, it's, it's part of the problem. There's a, there's a lot of different things that we can talk about here. We have a are, planning are process. Into this. Yeah. We have a planning process on Kauai, which 20 years ago, when they did the, the most recent general plan before the one that has just come out, uh, pro projected that tourism would, they were right on in terms of what would happen with the population. They, under, underestimated tourism, uh, but they said that planning was sort of for naught on Kauai because it never really works out that way. And what what needs to happen is the natural cycle of a big storm comes along, does a whole lot of damage, uh, sets the the entire island back a few years, as Hurricane Aniki did and Hurricane Iwa. Uh, now we've had this, and then, there, then the process begins anew. Uh, and there are people after our more, most recent storm living out on the very west end of the island in Ka and Hyena and those communities uh, are loving the isolation. The, the roads closed. <laughs> I know. They're loving the isolation. They're saying it's the Kauai of 50 years ago. <clears throat> well, can't make a living from the Kauai of 50 years ago today. Yeah. So we have to, it's, it's a, a balance we have to find. So I'm, I'm curious what um, you, you have to say, Colby, as far as what you see as some of the challenges, you know, being part of a, a part of business, uh, being part of a, a little bit of a younger generation, and also being in that particular area that's seeing a lot of changes. What he are, what installed are the things my air that, conditioning, by the way. <laughs> <That's right. Yeah. laughs> so what are some, personally, to, to you, what are some of the things that stand out that uh, are challenges? You know, the, the biggest thing which, you know, we all struggle here in Hawaii, and especially Kauai, is, uh, you know, cost of living. 
you know, um, you know, our whole goal, or my whole goal, and a lot of my workers, you know, our, our goal is to own a home, you know, provide for your family. Um, so, you know, a single family home nowadays, you know, it's seven hundred thousand dollars. A condo, I think, 2017 was maybe a little over four hundred thousand dollars. And to afford that, you know, a $700,000 house, you need to put down uh, $180,000 um, to make a $500,000 mortgage. Mm -hmm. So you need to make about $150,000 to afford that. And here in Hawaii, you know, our public school system, you know, we, we tend to test bad, you know. So a lot, of, um, a lot of parents try to send their kids to a private school, so that's about fifteen thousand dollars per child or more so, so yeah. you get two you know as you add to that, so you're up to a hundred eighty thousand dollars you know you need to make and if you have more kids it's adds up and you know that's just an an average so you know the cost of living is is definitely a big issue um, you know to actually uh, you know survive or you know make ends meet you know not living paycheck to paycheck which a lot of people do on Kauai, you know. Um, one dip in the in the road, you know, it could set you back. You know, it takes you months to kind of recoup from that. So, um, you know, and you know, traffic's a big issue also. Yeah. You know, commuting. It's getting tough. Yeah. Really, it's, really tough. You, you had a good. Um, uh, we had a good little discussion in the break room. You were talking about um, uh, another business in the area and how, in my mind, I've. And I've heard a good amount about the, the wages not being high enough, but that's not necessarily, in no, some cases, that's sometimes that's the case. But if you, if you put it in the context of what Colby is talking about, even with what right. people would consider fairly good wages, it it's was still a chef not. Yeah. In Kilauea, uh, <clears throat> who pays kitchen workers uh, about 18 to $26 an hour which is, or more, which is, which is great which by is most standards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's only able to, to maintain about a four-person kitchen staff where he actually needs six. He can't get people. He can't hold on to people. They, for, largely because all roads lead to housing in, in many ways on Kauai. People get sick of living out of their cars, living on the beach, uh, sharing a, a room somewhere or a, a tiny little apartment. Uh, they can't afford to, to continue living on the North Shore, and they and they leave. So this restaurant is now being forced to close one day a week, wow. and the restaurant next to it, same deal, for the same reason. How is it for you finding finding workers, finding staff? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> our industry is kind of a specialized industry. Yeah. Um, so it's you know a lot of people we bring from the ground up. You know, as a plantation closed, you know there's a lot of yeah. you know mechanically inclined. Um, people that came from that so we're able to um, mold some of them into our industry but that's, that's a really good point is is looking at industries that make sense based on Kauai's history mm -hmm. and and what what type of fabric is there already and kind of building on that that's a, that's a really good point yeah. and I think also the the idea around um, supporting our local businesses and and then like I, I like what you mentioned about um, growing them from from bottom up, you know, like if it's um, su supporting them through um, maybe taking classes at Kauai Community College to get some some of their training there, or you know, through scholarships, and then providing and these kinds of opportunities in our hometowns, you know, and knowing that they will go get some education get some training, get some experience, but then coming back and knowing that there are opportunities on island um, or you know, do we need to create these opportunities so that our OP or our young ones want to come back and want to be excited to come back. And, and no doubt we're going to talk a little bit more about that as, as the, um, the show goes on. But Amy, let me get to you yeah. and just talk about what, what stands out to you uh, right off the bat as far as some of the main challenges on the island. Well, one I'm still feeding off of Kobe is that um, that you're taking people from Kauai and growing them yes. and those people already have homes yes. they already have family and so they are going to stay around and you're giving them the training or giving them the opportunity 
to grow themselves into the industry mm -hmm. instead of uh, we have a lot of students that will come out of KCC but don't have the past experience and so a lot of industry will not hire them or if they don't have the correct degrees they won't be hired but they're the ones who are here and who are likely to stay here and so finding the balance and and how to to accept the fact that somebody is from here, cares about this place, I'm talking about Kauai, of course, mm -hmm. um, and is willing to learn, and then hiring those people and growing the people of Kauai. I see that's an interesting um, <clears throat> discussion as to how much do you want the emphasis as, as far as um, future industries or industries that we focus on to be on uh, the industries that have a connection to Kauai's past or to the ones that we need to have and develop for the sake of sustaining its future, which of course there's an overlap there. But um, you know, I think, I think there's a comparison there between, in some ways, between developing agriculture and transferring that into other industries mm -hmm. and uh, the reality of what we need for, for nursing and, and medical care on the island, um, home care, for elderly care, and trying to figure out how are we going to make those bridges and build those industries because that's what the community needs. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, is that, do you feel that is part of the, the discussion in the planning process or not enough as far as what makes sense? I think we, we fail to uh, create opportunities to both deal with kids who, will, who want to stay on island, mm -hmm. but also those who go away to school. Young, young men down the street uh, finished Kapaha High School, went to Cal State, San Luis Obispo in California. He's an engineering student. There is no future on Kauai that will draw him back to the island. He would like to do that when he graduates. There's no career pathway for him on Kauai. And you look at this and you see that replicated again and again and again. So it's not just the people who have stayed, we need to attract young people who have moved off island to come back. We need both of those kinds of folks. And we're not, we're not getting enough of either at this point. So I'm gonna ask you guys about um, um, some solutions and initiatives in just a little bit here, but um, let, me let me ask you this. Uh, this kind of leads into one other topic. Here's a question for somebody. And I'm curious to hear what your response is because I'm not sure if everybody would agree with this. But they say, how has Kauai managed to stay away from the overgrowth that Oahu, Maui, and the Big Island has experienced? Kauai still has the closest thing to old Hawaii compared to other urban areas. And yeah, if you compare it to, you know, Oahu, Honolulu, or something like that, or, uh, you know, some areas of Kahului, then yeah. <clears throat> Not that big, and I think we have something on population growth here, but we are still, and we, we are still seeing some growth, and we are still seeing some changes, um, and some growing pains. When, okay, there's still sort of a, a perception um, and, and a will towards what some might call old Hawaii and keeping Kauai that way. Mm. Where do you place that in where Kauai needs to be to bring people back to create this type of sustainability for people's lives so that they can live there and thrive. You're looking for a two word answer. <laughs> <laughs> tough, uh, yeah, tough questions we're all asking here, tough questions. Your thoughts? Well, we had a viable agricultural industry when the, in, the, in the sugar days and before with other crops. Uh, we have all this fallow agri ag land uh, there's this myth that somehow Kauai can be food self-sufficient. We can't. That's not possible. But we certainly can do more than we are. Expand so, on that a little bit, if you don't mind. Well, <clears throat> we don't have the population size to, for example, there are farmers on Oahu who produce enough crops to sell on other islands. We don't have that on Kauai. We don't have agricultural industries that produce the volume of product to put into the marketplace and make money, which unfortunately is what farming is about. It's a business just like any other. Uh, plus, 
who want, there, there's a, a, a huge shortage of people who want to work on farms. Mm -hmm. Farming is today uh, a very high tech, uh, very sophisticated business. We're not making that translation. We're not seeing agriculture bounce back. Although fortunately, uh, one recently relocated or recently located seed company, Hartung Brothers, mm -hmm. wants to get into production scale agriculture on Kauai. We need to be encouraging much more of that. Yeah, I mean, to me, I, I believe that our, our island can be self-sufficient. Um, that's part of my vision. I think every one of our islands throughout our Pai Aina, throughout Hawaii, um, can be restored to be a Aina Momona, a, 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 a land that can thrive but it, it'll take the right kind of regulations. It'll take the right kind of, you know, inspiring the right people to get back into agriculture. I mean, if it's not like uh, one big production, I mean, how do we support our small farmers um, in our communities? I mean, yes, we're, you're, we're trying to, we're working towards that. Um, and for me, I think, you know, just that sustainability, that self-sufficiency and living off of the land, living off of our resources. I mean, it's a goal that many of us have. It's that vision that we need to work towards, I think. Yeah, and I, you know, I agree. You know, it's definitely our goal, but um, I think the whole resistance is, um, you know, real estate on Kauai. Real estate, it's, isn't it? you know, rarely you'll find a, a, a a farmer that owns a property mm -hmm. that they're mm -hmm. grazing on True. or mm -hmm. raising crops on. And, you know, for us, my family's been raising cattle for generations. You know, they came over, worked a sugar plantation and tried to raise sugar, but, you know, they're getting pennies on the dollar from the plantation, so they ended up moving into cattle. Until today, we still, you know, have uh, cattle. Um, you know, we have a slaughterhouse, what, my family. What's helped with the business to sustain that? Yes. Yeah, so. It costs more for us to house the animal on Kauai from start to finish. It's cheaper for us to take the calves, ship them to the mainland, and then bring them back to slaughter. Wow. Mm. Um, last wow. year we, we shipped out, uh, Kauai shipped out about maybe 3,500 heads of cattle, which is a lot, mm -hmm. you know. But, um, you know, we bring in much more than that, right? So. Same thing with feed, too. Same thing yeah. with feed, yeah. <clears throat> you know, but isn't that so starting expensive. to change? I've, I've heard <clears throat> that, there, that there's more Kauai raised beef. There is. The, in initiative, around. the initiative is, is more Growing. now. <laughs> you know, so a lot of people are, are doing that. But, you know, we, we ship out, I would say, maybe 80% of our, hmm. our cattle. Wow. So what, what else is helping? What are, or what else is, is, has entered into the discussion that you feel could help um, Kauai farmers or you know you know in a, these types of industries that would help the island be more sustainable. What do you what 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 has been floated out there that you think we need to stick to the wall <laughs> a little bit Focus better for the sake specialized of the agriculture. I, I did a story recently uh, on how sugar is not dead in Hawaii, mm -hmm. and it's certainly not dead on Kauai. There's a company called Kaloa Rum, mm -hmm. a niche Agricole company. Rum. Uh, yeah. It's thriving, it's expanding. We need to encourage more, I hate to use the word niche because it sounds so elitist, uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a marketing issue. Okay. Uh, where, can, where can you envision a market for a product and sell it there? This that translates into jobs on mm -hmm. Kauai. Mm -hmm. See, does. now this, this brings up a, a, an important a question from one of our viewers here. This is from Judy. Um, uh, kind of the, the the, the two sides of the coin here. She's from Kauai and she says she loves buying Kauai grown products, but they're always way overpriced compared to other items. And a lot of these specialty items, I mean, I, 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 I would say that's my general opinion. Um, they're beautiful and you want to support local, but typically they're much more expensive. And I, I can see why if you're, if you're, say for example, if it's a, a smaller um, production, then of course that would think the cost go. What, but what else do you want to tell Judy and people who say, look, we're, we want to buy local, well, but typically it's it's so much more expensive. And uh, you know, how am I supposed to? Yeah, and I you know I think that. it's not a one word um, answer. No, you know, it's kind of a cocktail of you know we got high real estate, we got low competition. You know, with competition we get 
lower prices typically, but we have, you know, our government costs a lot of money to, <laughs> to operate, so we got that high expense. And, you know, Kaloa rum, I think, is one of our main exports out of the island. Let me um, ask you this. Let me put it to you guys this way. What do, you th what do you think people should know about and support that will help um, the homegrown industries thrive? What, what's going to help? It's, it's supporting local. It's paying a little bit more, you know, and the more people get on board. What's going to help to bring down those... Um, those costs. I would imagine a lot of it has to do with initiatives um, within um, that are offered by either the county or the state in some shape or form. It's it's tough to find enough help to run even a small farm at a price you can afford if you're a small farmer. If you're working one, two, five, ten acres, mm -hmm. tiny little farm. Uh, you have young people in the woofer program who are being paid nothing or almost nothing. What's the woofer program? Uh, it's, uh, you can, uh, I forget what it's, it's an acronym and I forget what it stands for, but uh, young people sort of on their gap year travels mm. going around the world alight on farming jobs on Kauai. Uh, I pick them up as hitchhikers, <laughs> <laughs> see them. In, and they in, tell, you, in, tell you stories. In Moa. Uh, and they're here from all over the world. The farms they're working at can't afford to pay them virtually anything and still make money. So we're talking about a scale issue. We have to get, I think, over, not to disagree with you, but we have to get past the idea that small is good. In agriculture, we have to start thinking in the, in the context of taking things to some kind of scale so that it's actually economically viable. Well, let me ask you guys one more question before I move on to some other topics and some other uh, viewer questions on, on this same note. Uh, a lot of people like to poo-poo Monsanto. People think that's a, a bad word. Um, uh, not everybody, but some do. But uh, one of the things that, for example, they have done is they um, essentially would rent out, lease out their land, and they have a lot of the equipment there for the farmers to use who can't afford to have that equipment on their own. What are your thoughts? Do you think those types of programs need to happen, say, for example, on the west side? Because I believe uh, uh, Grow Farms out there owns a lot of that, and some of the seed industries have exited, so you've got some land there to work with. And I believe some of those types of initiatives um, toward agriculture are being discussed out on that side and how they can make that work. Well, what have you guys heard? Is that uh, Do you think that's one of those areas where... It kind of creates that bridge, or what are your thoughts? Who wants to jump in? That's an interesting question. I mean, uh, that that's a hot topic on Kauai. It's a hot topic. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it, not, it, 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 was, it, was, it wasn't so much the, the company. It was the creating a, um, yeah. a, a, a program yeah. where you provide the infrastructure mm -hmm. that small farmers or small businesses cannot afford. Well, you know, an example I heard of recently, and... It made my all my gut feel a, a little turned. Was so um, one of the companies provided their equipment to work down in the Koloa Poipu area um, to clear off one of the alahele, um, the the trails, traditional trails, and um, in exchange, some of the partnership was going to be, hey, we'll give you some land and. Um, maybe you'll be able to start a, a grove of poor keni keni trees. And with these trees, you can produce these beautiful flowers. You'll make beautiful lay. Maybe it'll be an economic development to sell it to the hotels, put it into, you know, the, the local economy. Um, and I don't know, I felt a little mm, mixed about it because, uh, well, one, I'm a lay maker. I love making lays. So I, on that side, I'm like, that's really innovative to provide this land, to start this poor Kenny Kenny farm, and to, to bring these lay and make it more available to our community. But on the other side, I don't know if that's the right partnership um, because I don't know how healthy the land is after it being used for certain things that these, these um, specific companies um, the, their kinds of practices. I mean, so that's where I get this trust, mixed trust feeling. Issue. Trust issue. So, and I think that's where, I mean, everybody does this balancing act 
um, and you make you make that choice in yeah. your community if this is uh, that kind of partnership that you would like to to have. Okay, I'm getting scolded. I need viewer questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Let me get to some of these things. I just think it's, it's a really important discussion, and, and uh, no doubt we, it always turns out where we don't have quite as much time to get to everything we want to get to. But let's get to some of these. Just to be right. clear, Monsanto is not on Kauai. True, right, right. It's not. I, I'm aware of that. Correct. Just uh, an example that that oftentimes gets tagged onto that, that mm -hmm. conversation. Um, so let me, some of these are kind of uh, different questions, not necessarily associated, but let's uh, let's get to it anyway. Super, this is from Larry Dove. Super ferry issue was a fiasco, says so Larry. <laughs> island wants to stay quote unquote local, but love rich tourists coming to the island to spend money. They need to decide what their focus is. Um, yeah, this one just kind of, sorry, that diverted from our conversation here, but, <laughs> but it just goes to show some of the issues that really um, are kind of deeply sort of rooted in people's sides as far as what Kauai needs, what's good for the island, what's not good for the island. Um, fiasco, not a fiasco? I, I mean, I think people are still talking about it. <laughs> and our sense, are, are hesitant to talk about it sometimes, but, but you know, this is, this is the reality of kind of, you know, keeping the island moving in some shape or form. The ferry turned out to be fiasco for a variety of reasons, mm -hmm. uh, many of them having to do with the state government botching uh, the whole process by which the, the ferry was more or less approved. Uh, but the people of Kauai rejected it mm -hmm. uh, emphatically. Uh, and there are, there are, actually those two ships are now, they're now in the U.S. Navy, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, they were, yeah. they were sold at auction and somehow the Navy got them. Uh, but whether ocean-based transportation is really something, something that people are going to rely on for passenger use and for getting around families and people to, from island to island, I'm not sure about that. Mm -hmm. It's a very rough channel. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's an extremely yeah. difficult uh, six to nine hour voyage. Uh, and it's not pleasant. Uh, so who's actually going to use the ferry? If, if, and it's, it came up again this year. Pretty tight mm -hmm. there in the Willowilly Harbor, too. <laughs> it's pretty tight in there. Well, and a big worry, I think, for many communities are um, what comes in with exactly. a lot of that movement. Exactly. You know, I mean, it's not just the ferry, because even when our, you know, like when you, we're coming back, or let's say when we're leaving Hawaii, going to any other country, we get we have to send our bags to get checked. You know, what kind of flowers? Yeah, the ad check. I mean, it's more there's more scrutiny of us going out than it is coming in. Coming in, they say, oh, claim it on the form, drop it in this bin over here, but it really should be about what's coming in. I mean, on Kauai today, we heard recently about Rod, right? Yes. The rapid yes. ohia death on Kauai. How did that, I mean, sure, there's many ways of how it could have come, but there's big concerns, I mean, of what can come through these different methods. And you look at all the other invasions that have come in through, actually, for on the airlines mm -hmm. and on the shipping. Um, they're still worried about the brown tree snake because no matter how many times they inspect, a brown tree snake will show up every mm. once in a while. Um, I think. The focus has been, and maybe I'm not realistic, but our, when we talk about what's good for Kauai, we tend to look at what's good for bringing money in. I'm that looking leads, at what's good for the land. And that leads to, to one question from, from Michael from Maui. He says, since Kauai is used as a major Hollywood backdrop and generates dollars from tourism, why doesn't that help with the island's economy? That sort of, the disconnect maybe is to sort of what exactly is happening with tourism? Is it helping? Is it hurting? Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to obviously talk a little bit more about the traffic issue. Um, Roger from Lanai, getting a few, few questions here. Hawaii, such a unique place, says Roger, and a beautiful place. We have a finite amount of land and should slow down the pace of progress before we can no longer enjoy our island's natural, natural beauty. But that, that's a tough one. That's a tough one to figure out what, what does that mean to slow down progress? What are we, what are we talking about here exactly? Or is it more um, understanding how we want to handle progress? What, what type of progress do we want to have, I might, I might ask you? Well, we have to make some decisions about do we want to change the, the norm in terms of how communities are uh, are distributed on island. Mm. 
do we want to go to like there you were you mentioned the uh, the housing development on the west side and there's this whole notion that uh, Alexander and Baldwin A and B mm -hmm. uh, one of the three big landowners uh, made the mistake of dropping the term second city mm -hmm. uh, wow. at a county council mm -hmm. meeting. Now it wouldn't be the second city because Kapa'a is the, first, the biggest and Lihui is the second so it wouldn't be the second city but it would, it, the proposal would be to develop it on what is currently agricultural land uh, and create a new town, hopefully creating jobs with it. But we need to stop growing towns out horizontally, mm -hmm. start finding more ways to concentrate jobs and understand that the, the, the old model that everybody's going to have a nice house with a driveway, uh, that's no longer operative. Yeah. This is a very important part of, I think, the discussion here on, on uh, for Kauai Island, as well as part of the planning process right now, right? There's been so much discussion about how do we treat the different communities on the island? Do we allow a more of an um, a individual identity for each of these? Is that going to be better for these communities? Or do we really try to kind of bring everything together in a more, what some might consider a more cohesive way? Where do you see Kauai developing in that way? What is your perspective on, based on the way that Kauai has developed so far, and these, some, some would say, very different communities from you know Waimea to North Shore to Hanapepe or whatever, um, some would define as pretty different. They are profoundly different. Profoundly yes. different. Yes. So, how then? What do you? How do you see the the that those communities either coming together, or should there be? I don't want to say separation, but maybe separate identities in some shape or form for the betterment of each community. What do you? Where do you see that going? What are your thoughts right now? I love that about Kauai, yes. that we're so unique in every community is has its products, has its ways, has its way of talking. You know, like Anahola pigeon compared to <laughs> Anapepe Waimea pigeon is different. True. It really True. is. I, my friends just pointed it out to me on a recent travel. But we're so unique. and um, But yet, we all have this same aloha for kawaii. Mm -hmm. And it's like weaving a lei, you know, we're unique. We bring all the different flowers together, but it becomes this beautiful lepo. So when you talk about community <clears throat> planning, though, so what if, I mean, this is, of course, the, the mindset you want to have. Yeah. But when you talk about the county planning as a whole, because this is one county, yeah, really, how do you then break sure. that down? Yeah, I really think, um, I agree. I really think we need to groom these communities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the beauty of Kauai is, you know, the greenery. It's lush. You can look around and see a lot of beauty in the island. But what's happening is everyone loves that beauty, so everyone branches out and want to be right in the center of that beauty, right? And what's happening is these towns or communities, and, and my idea is, you know, they're getting more spread out, and there's a lot of holes in between. And what happens is, you know, where there's more traffic, there's more driving, so I think we really need to focus on these key communities, right? Lihue, Kapa, you know, throughout the island, and really um, perfect them before we start branching out mm -hmm. and trying to reinvent the wheel elsewhere. But on the west side, there's a strong argument to be made that people are dependent, too dependent on employment in Lihue, in, in primarily, or in particular Lihue, but also in Poipu. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there, there are a lot of traffic, people. traffic, by the way, here in some of the towns <laughs> behind you. Kapa'a crawl. Yeah. Uh, and Kalaheo on the, on the west side now is starting to give Kapa'a a run for its money yeah. in terms of uh, in terms of traffic. Yeah, we were talking about Waimea Town and what it can be exactly. like on an average day mm -hmm. these days. So why, wh amazing. What all, those people are not primarily tourists. Those people are primarily locals. What are they doing? They're, mm -hmm. ma many of them are going to work. We have morning and afternoon rush hours. Mm -hmm. So if if it's difficult for people in Keikaa or Waimea or Hanapepe to continue commuting to Lihui, the only alternative to provide them is jobs closer to home. Right. So that's one of the objectives of the plan, the, the new general plan that's just come out. And I think, I mean, 
I started looking more into and becoming an active member of the, the general plan process. So I recently got invited to be a part of a focus group for the West Kauai Regional Plan. So Hana Pepe, our plan wasn't updated since the 70s. So this is exciting for us to now have a time to collaborate with our West Side communities from Hana Pepe Ele Ele, and I think actually it starts from Wahiava all the way to Mana Polihale. So this whole West Side Kauai Regional Plan is gonna, I actually today got an email of when our first focus group meeting will be. And so there's representatives from the different communities and we will look at what is, how do we define mm -hmm. our, our regional plan? How do we talk about traffic? How do we try to solve some of these problems? And you know, what do we need to look at? Not just, again, West Side, but now looking at it overall. Are there a couple things you can share that maybe people aren't as familiar with that, that are starting to bubble up? Um, you know, I mean, for, so I, I'm a active member of the Hanapepe Elele Community Association, and we've been an uh, active part of the regional planning. Um, so, you know, it, it became um, the second city idea. I mean, we hosted a and B to come and talk to us, talk to the community. Hanapepe Library was full. <laughs> I mean, we had people really? standing room yeah. only. You know, they were really concerned. It was, for me, as a um, resident, I was, I was happy to see people come out from mm -hmm. all over, from Poipu all the way to Kekaha, you know, and they were um, sharing their concerns and they wanted to know what, are, what is a part of this plan, this provisional agricultural land, this affordable housing that's happening, and how is that gonna impact the rest of us on the west side, you know, and so, I, I like these discussions of how can we create these opportunities in the communities, it grow, the growth we can see in Kekaha, the growth we can see in Waimea, in Hanapepe. I mean, our Hanapepe, our little, the, the what, biggest, littlest town in <laughs> all of Kauai, I mean, Every Friday we have our um, our art night. I mean, it's a thriving it's, it's, little Friday night. I was night. there last year. That was amazing. Um, yeah. So you know, I mean, how do we support these kinds of activities in our communities? And I mean, I think that goes back to the whole support local and putting our the dots a little bit. Yeah, I, I mean, I love being able to be in Hanapepe or any one of our communities, and sometimes even go to Kapa'a and enjoy some of their once a month kind of event, you know? Well, time's ticking as usual, but it's, I wanna make sure I get to a couple more here. And this is something we talked about earlier, the, the healthcare situation on the island and sort of making that connection between providing the kind of care that, that people need for the different um, uh, sectors of the population. Uh, Didi from Kauai, uh, retired caller, concerned about the senior population of Kauai. She feels uh, there are not enough qualified caregivers for one and people um, in the medical field to serve the aging communities. And we're talking about what's happening over at KCC and um, one of the focuses, mm -hmm. one of the focuses being the nursing program there and the, the successes and the challenges that you're seeing right now with how the program is working. Talk about that a little bit. Well, the program has had a lot of success in the students learning what they need to get their licenses. So they pass all the license exams. It's them getting all of the experience. Um, being able to do hands-on work anywhere. Uh, they don't really have enough of that experience. And so when it comes down to the nitty gritty, they've got the theory, but not so much the practice. What do you, so and what do you see is, happening with the program and what do you think will help? Well, the program is branching out into different areas. We've got um, the medical assistance, we've got the regular nursing and being able to go on all the way up to getting the master's program. I really do believe that it's, again, getting that hands-on experience. And when we get our new uh, Oihana director is going to be making the contacts with the, the industry so that students will be able to go do in practicums, um, apprenticeships, things like that. But then we also need to get, again, to have those students be the ones who are hired. Yeah, I think that's a, a huge, a good point there. Um, you know, I caretake for my grandfather for years, and he recently passed this um, past December, mm -hmm. and it was, you know, a real difficult time to find mm -hmm. qualified caregivers, and we ended up falling on two students. You know, really? but right. 
So the students were able to get the experience, but yet we got to work around their schooling schedule. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult for us to manage, you know, our working schedule around their working schedule. So some type of program where that's actually part of their schooling, I think would be fantastic because it would be a set time. You know, you could manage this with, with some of these in-home care I'm talking about. Yeah, boy, that's um, a great idea. And it was, um, it was difficult. Um, my mom and I and my wife, you know, we kind of shared that responsibility, but at times it's, it's, it was really tough. Yeah. And so that type of, uh, I think, apprenticeship program or however you face it would, would definitely be a great, great idea. And that would also be a support for them because so many of our students are full-time students, full-time parents, and they also right. have a job. Mm -hmm. yeah. So who else do you think can be, uh, to continue this, this is so important for so many people and so many families, my, myself, uh, my family included, w who else do you think are the players here? that need to be stepping up a little bit more to help out to create these types of bridges and to create these types of opportunities um, for uh, people in the medical field that well, can help I, Yeah, I mean, another resource on Kauai um, that, because I'm also a caregiver for my mom, and that's what brought me back so to Kauai. So many families, so many. Yeah, and um, so one of the resources is these um, elderly care, um, it's called the, uh, yeah, Care. no, they're, um, so this one is based right by Hamura Simon, a okay. very popular um, business there. What? What's Hamura Simon? <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but it's the Kauai Adult um, Day Center, mm -hmm. and part of their funding also comes from the county of Kauai, so my mom goes there Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, oh, that's the one my grandma goes to. Okay. Okay. Now which one? Okay, yeah, and I mean the county <laughs> bus comes pick up my uh -huh, mom. Same thing. You know, takes mom to Lihue. I mean, I don't have to do a 30-minute drive to drop her off. When she's done, she comes home. Um, you know, she's able to go on her wheelchair, uh, and then they provide lunch for her. Um, you know, provide snacks. Um, for me, I mean, I think that would be a great place for a lot of these students to. Um, participate in to get some experience. Um, one of my concerns, and I've shared it through some of the evaluations, is um, having a more culturally appropriate kind of uh, program for a lot of our Native Hawaiian kupuna that are there. You know, I mean, we have, I mean, the kupuna there are of all different ethnic backgrounds. Um, you know, and how do we um, support that? Like, how do we feed them? Because um, many of our Japanese or Filipino, they, they want to eat poi just like our Hawaiian kupuna. So how do we bring that kind of diet back mm -hmm. into um, these kinds of programs too and make that ono, you know, bring the adobo and the poi or, you know, all this ono food that our kupuna just have so many awesome memories about. Yeah. And, you know, bring that quality of life back for our kupuna. And I think sometimes these programs are lacking that. And I mean, it's the same thing like in our, a lot of our, um, elementary, middle, and high school programs, you know, there's a lot of talk about this farm to table programs, mm -hmm. farm to school programs. You know, how does that look? I, I hear about some of that coming up on Kauai. I mean, I fully mm -hmm. support it. How do we support it? Can we have enough mm -hmm. farms that can go directly to our school, right? And bring that ono back to the, the kiki. See, these are part of the discussions that need to happen at the meetings that you're talking about that everybody needs <laughs> yeah. to get involved in because everybody's getting excited and interested about this and they want to participate. So make sure they pay attention to what you guys are talking about. So let me get to this question here because we are, believe it or not, we're almost out of time. And uh, I, I'm curious to hear how you might respond to this. This is coming from former Big Island Mayor Billy Kinoy. Uh, he's credited with posing a kind of a pretty interesting question. Pretty interesting question. He said, as a resident of Hawaii, do you believe we are a state of islands or an island state? Who wants to jump in and try, try their hand at that one? Do you believe we are a state of islands or an island state? I think we're a state of islands because each one has its own identity, unified by a, a state government. But you, you can't pretend that the islands in the chain are, are some cohesive, homogenized, single thing. They're not. And that's our strength. I think you talk to any um, Hawaiian on Kauai, they'll tell you they're an island state, mm -hmm. if I'm defining that the way that I'm thinking. That Kauai has always been an independent part of our history. 
Um, anybody that knows the, the mo'olelo of Hawaii knows Kauai was a very strong part and in the end decided to join up with the rest and to become a state of islands, a pai'aina. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're, we're an island. I think we need to think as, island, as an island. I mean, sure, we all have ohana on the other islands, and how do we continue to network? And an island uh, mm -hmm. moving forward together as best as possible. So that's part of the discussion. And believe it or not, we are actually out of time. So mahalo <laughs> to all of you for joining us tonight. And we thank all of our guests, um, Alan Parakini, a freelance journalist from the North Shore, uh, Colby Anon, a business owner, Amy Summers, an instructor of Hawaiian language at Kauai Community College, and Malia Nobrega Oliveira from the Hawaii Nui Akia School of Hawaiian Knowledge and Director of Strategic Partnerships and Community Engagement. So important, make sure everybody gets there online. We can find information about how some of these meetings happen. There's so much more to talk about. All right, next week on Insights, it's all about the youngest, biggest, and most recently famous island in our state. A lot of talk about the Big Island. A fellow Insights moderator, Yunji Denise, will be joined by four residents from the island where she was born. Hawaii Island is up next in our Quality of Life series right here next week. I'm Laurie Amato for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Uhiho.